Good evening and welcome. Tonight we're going to be reading this book, Breakfast in the Rainforest, A Visit with Mountain Gorillas by Richard Sobel. It's got some really great library book cover sounds. That's where we're going tonight to Uganda. And let's start off with the introduction great map. You can see there's the capital city of Kampala, and over here we have Pwindi Impenetrable National Park, Kisoro, and Ngahinga Gorilla National Park. As a wildlife photographer, I have been chased by a hippo, sprayed by a whale, and licked by an orangutan. With many natural habitats around the world rapidly shrinking and disappearing, I travel the globe to photograph species of endangered animals before they are driven to extinction. One such animal struggling for survival is the mountain gorilla. Unfortunately, there, unfortunately, there are only about 650 of these powerful yet shy creatures left on earth. Although cartoons and movies often exaggerate gorillas, portraying them as fierce bullies, they are actually quiet, peaceful animals. Fascinated by this contrast, I took the long journey into the lush rainforests of Africa to stare deep into the wide eyes of some of our world's few remaining mountain gorillas. By telling the story of these gorillas and of the people who work to protect them, I hope to share with you a rare experience that few have had, and invite you to join me for breakfast in the rainforest. Richard Sobel. Getting close enough to photograph some of the few mountain gorillas alive on our planet today is a real challenge. Mountain gorillas don't survive in captivity, so none can be found in zoos. The entire remaining population lives in the dense rainforests of two neighboring national parks in Central Africa, nearly 7,000 miles away from my home in New England. To prepare for my trip, I spent a lot of time researching mountain gorillas. I accumulated a two-foot stack of books on my desk, more than I could ever read. I also talked at length with a gorilla expert at Harvard University and with Farley Mowat, the author who studied and edited the diaries of legendary mountain gorilla researcher Diane Fossey. All my homework helped me to develop a strong scientific knowledge of the lives and habitats of mountain gorillas. For instance, I learned that the mountain gorilla is the largest of all primates, the zoological order that includes chimpanzees, orangutans, and even humans. I also learned that mountain gorillas are gentle giants. Their strong, muscular chests hide a tender nature. They eat a mostly vegetarian diet, with just a few ants, insects, or termites mixed in to add protein. Searching for food is their full-time job, and most days they are content to swing and climb through the forests, seeking fresh thickets of plants and bushes. Once they find a fertile spot, they stop and munch on leaves and fruits, and then take long naps or groom one another. This is the time of day when the gorillas sit together for breakfast that I wanted to photograph them. Once my plane tickets to Uganda have been purchased, it takes me several days to pack all of my gear. There are no camera repair shops in the African backcountry, so I need to check and recheck that everything is working. Cameras, lenses, film, and packs all get tested before I leave. Two Nikon cameras should be enough, but I always take a backup, so I pack three for this journey. After two days of flying and a ten-hour wait to change planes in London, I arrive, wobbly and weary, in Kampala, Uganda's capital city. Once there, I pick up my official gorilla tracking permits from the Uganda Wildlife Authority. There are four gorilla families in Uganda that can be visited by small groups of no more than six people each day. Visitor permits are sometimes reserved more than two years in advance. 
These permits are expensive. Each one-hour session costs more than $200, ten times more than a Ugandan National Park's permit for a full day with lions, hippos, or elephants. I pay $800 in total for four permits, each to be used on a different day. Money from these permits helps the Uganda Wildlife Authority pay park rangers, buy vehicles, and provide medicine or research studies for other animals that need help. The mountain gorillas are indeed the superstars of all the endangered species in this region. And many other wildlife groups have the gorillas to thank for the resources that keep them safe. After a day of rest, I hop into a beat-up four-wheel drive vehicle for the bone-jarring, teeth-rattling eight-hour ride along the steep, winding mountain roads. We're headed 200 miles southwest from Kampala to Windy Impenetrable National Park. Although the local people call them roads, the hard-packed dirt roads are more like giant curly fries speckled with big chunks of salt. They weave up in spirals dotted with piles of rock and dirt that fall from the steep cliffs during the overnight rains. In spite of the landscape's sharp angles, the roads are surrounded by fields of bananas, beans, and tea, which hug the sides of the hills. The women and children who plant and work these small gardens ignore the force of gravity, their bare feet pressing into the rich soil so that they can harvest the food that they need for their survival. Because there are few cars or trucks traveling here, the roads become wide sidewalks alive with people who walk or push bikes along the steep curves. Everyone is carrying something, and often the load is larger than the carrier. Some have huge piles of cut greens. Others bring firewood or baskets of vegetables to sell at the market. Many balance containers of water like baseball caps on top of their heads. Children have school books or garden tools with rough wooden handles piled up on their backs, or bicycles or handmade scooters. With few spare parts available, most of the bikes are missing pedals or spokes, and have rusty chains that clang and squeal as they turn. The scooters are carved out of dried wood and fastened together with pegs and string. Pages are hard to turn. There we go. As I near Kisoro, the town closest to where the mountain gorillas live, one set of jagged peaks replaces another around each winding corner, and the long rays of sunlight fall into deep shadows. In this small corner of Africa, Uganda, Rwanda, and the Democratic Republic of the Congo meet in a chain of rough mountains called the Virungas. The steep slopes all around me are part of an active volcanic range that thrusts high up into the soft rain clouds. It is here that the last remaining mountain gorillas make their home, divided almost equally between two areas that are protected and monitored by national park rangers. The two populations once lived together in a single large forest. Little by little, over hundreds of years, African farmers cleared land in the central valley of the gorilla habitat, and the gorillas slowly divided into separate groups, one half living along the Virunga volcanoes, and the other half in Bwindi Impenetrable National Park. Although they now live only 30 miles apart, these two populations of gorillas will never meet, or even know that the other exists. Both groups, however, are affected by common problems. During the 35-year lifespan of these gorillas, the three neighboring countries have all experienced violent civil wars. At different times over the past two decades, the gorillas have heard blasts of gunfire on all sides of their habitats. At other times, poachers have made war on the helpless gorillas themselves. These battles, combined with the farming needs of the ever-expanding human population nearby, have shrunk the home range of the mountain gorillas so that it can barely sustain them. During my visit to Uganda, 
I am planning to see both the population in Buindi and the one in the Virungas in a national park called Mgahinga. To coordinate visitors, the Uganda Wildlife Authority has an office on the dusty main street of Kisoro that is wedged between an open-air barber shop and a pharmacy called the Human Drug Shop. I check in and meet 32-year-old Silver Mbongaba, Mbongaba yeah, who will be my guide on this expedition. Lean and muscular, with a broad smile, Silver grew up on the border of Buindi Impenetrable National Park and always dreamed of working as a park ranger. As we sit and share a bottle of neon red, super sugary Ugandan soda, he explains some of the local history to me. There he is. When Silver was a small boy, Buindi was called the Impenetrable Forest, a wildlife-filled place that few people dared enter. Not until 20 years ago, after the discovery of almost 300 mountain gorillas living within this dense forest, did scientists who had been working nearby in the Virungas come here to study them. Naturally shy and fearful, the gorillas stayed hidden in the trees. At first, researchers rarely saw a gorilla and learned what they could from the nests and droppings that the gorillas left behind as they traveled through the tightly woven forest. As they slowly gained the gorillas' acceptance, the researchers learned that mountain gorillas live together in small family troops led by the largest male. This leader is called a silverback because of the traumatic wedge of light fur that covers his back. The adult gorillas consume between 40 and 50 pounds of food each day. Since the leaves, shoots, bark, insects, and berries that they eat are small and lightweight, gorillas spend almost half of each day looking for food. I listen closely to Silver, but it is clear that an announcement has been broadcast to all the local mosquitoes Fresh blood has arrived in town. My hands, neck, and ankles are soon dotted with bites. They seem to know when Nzungu arrives, he says with a laugh as he grabs a bottle of repellent for me. Nzungu is our word for European and white visitors, he explains. Soon I stink of deed, having sprayed myself with enough slime to keep both mosquitoes and all other animals away, and Silver continues to tell me all he knows about the gorillas. Gorillas have strong bonds with one another and stay close together in family troops of 10 to 20. The males and females both care for and play with their young. This is most obvious during the late mornings after they have eaten, when they find a comfy place to nap during the heat of midday. The babies and smaller gorillas cling to the adults as family members groom one another picking bugs and gunk out of their deep fur. The babies will nurse and cling tightly to their mothers for their first six months. During this time, they see and smell the foods that their mothers are eating and are often showered with the crumbs and splinters that are the gorilla version of processed baby food. Mom will also teach her baby which foods not to eat by grabbing away the many poisonous plants that could make it sick. This is how the babies learn to recognize approximately 60 plants and trees that will make up their diet as they grow older and more independent. A baby gorilla will venture farther away from its mother's grasp, little by little, until it is about three years old and finally on its own. I rise the next morning before daybreak and drive from Kisoro to my first rendezvous with the gorillas. The dense forest that defines the border of the protected conservation land of Buindi Impenetrable National Park is easy to find. Orderly patches of potatoes and bananas grow right up to its rough edges. In addition to its 350 mountain gorillas, this rich rainforest is home to an abundance of wildlife. It holds more than 100 different mammals, 350 types of birds, 400 different butterflies, and more than 200 kinds of trees. All of this is in an area that is only one-tenth the size of Greater Boston, where I live. Silver Mbonigaba is now the chief ranger here at Buindi, having spent every day of the last four years in the company of gorillas. 
At first, the gorillas would flee deep into the forest when he and his trackers approached. But over time, the gorillas grew comfortable with the rangers, allowing them to get closer and closer. At sunrise each morning, Silver leaves the small house that he shares with his family and treks to meet the gorillas. These daily early morning ranger visits help to preserve the gorillas' acceptance of humans. As the morning continues, small groups of tourists accompany the trackers. The tourists' hotel and guide fees help support the local people, as well as the community's schools and medical clinics. Tips for service help the guides build homes for their families, expand their gardens, and perhaps even buy livestock that will help feed their families. There's Silver's goats. It's a really cool name, Silver. At the edge of the forest, Silver explains that there are many strict rules that all visitors must follow. First and foremost, he tells me that when we see the gorillas, we cannot disturb them. He firmly explains that my visit will be limited to exactly one hour. Any longer might alter the gorillas' regular daily patterns. No eating, no flash photography, no talking, no getting closer than 15 feet, and last of all, no sneezing, since sneezing could send germs through the air and make the gorillas sick. The family of gorillas that I will visit first is called the Kringo group. They are named for the little village next to where they were first seen. Although Silver and his team have been tracking these gorillas for four years, I will be the first photographer and pale-skinned visitor that the Kringo gorillas have encountered. I look so different from Silver and his team with their dark African skin. I ask Silver what the Nkuringo gorilla is will think of my pale complexion. Don't worry, he assures me with a laugh. With all of those cameras, the gorillas will hardly notice your skin color. As we pass a few mud huts and banana fields on the edge of the park, the terraced gardens of the local farmers give way to the sharp line of uncut forest. People live right up to the boundary of Buendi. And the gorillas do not always understand that they cannot eat the farmers' crops. Locals are surprised to learn that they are the only people in Africa or the rest of the world who live next to mountain gorillas. This makes them proud of their special role in helping to keep watch over their famous neighbors. If the gorillas stray from the park, the villagers alert Silver and his team, who chase them back across the borderline and into the safety of the forest. Mountain gorillas can spend almost all morning sitting and eating. Once the gorillas find a natural cafeteria of leaves, green bamboo, or wild celery roots to stop at for breakfast, they settle in and take their time feasting. Since this is when Silver and his team of rangers usually check in on them, the Nkuringo gorillas have gotten used to people visiting them during breakfast. Crossing into the park this early morning, we quickly begin our steep climb to visit the gorillas. There are no paths, sidewalks, or chairlifts for human guests. Once I plunge into the thick, wet forest, I have to overcome the same obstacles that the gorillas contend with each day. Silver opens his frayed notebook and checks the last location where the Nkuringo gorillas were observed yesterday. This will become the starting point for today's trek. As we move through the walls of brush, the trackers look for signs. Broken branches, piles of dung, and tracks in the mud offer clues to finding the path that the gorillas have made in their search for fresh food. I struggle and slip with each step on the wet roots and mud. The brown earth has been transformed into a slippery mush, and I feel like I'm trying to catch my grip on a semi-frozen waterfall. I grasp for branches and vines to pull myself up using muscles that I never knew I had. I feel as if I, too, am becoming an ape, crawling over fallen logs through dense brush and vines that seem determined to capture and strangle me as I try to pass. The lead tracker finds our first clue that gorillas are close, a wide, flat pile of spongy leaves and branches. 
These are the nests the gorilla slept in the night before. The forest flies have already found this fresh dung inside the nests and sent out word that breakfast was served. Thousands and thousands of buzzing specks swarm around, creating dark living clouds that feast on the gorilla droppings. As I look for a clear spot to stop and take a picture, I hear branches snapping and realize it is the gorillas racing up the hillside, searching for a breakfast buffet of their own. Here's their nest. Following silver, I crawl ahead. Long vines with sharp thorns attack my fingers as I move forward. I brush against a thick bush, and its stinging flowers grab onto my wet shirt and stick pointed needles into my shoulders. With my upper body under attack from the vegetation, I look down at a parade of red fire ants as they climb over my boots to bite and sting my legs. Now I don't know where to scratch or rub. Little pains are everywhere. Come on, Silver urges me. We're almost with them now. Swinging his machete, he quickly cuts through the brush and heavy vines to clear a three-foot-wide tunnel for me to peer through. Stopping and smiling widely, he whispers, Now look through these branches. The gorillas are here. They have stopped to eat, and we have found them. I am pulled in two directions. Should I grab my camera, or should I simply look ahead to see, with my own eyes, the mountain gorillas whom I have traveled so far to meet? I remind myself that I am here as a photographer, and that my first glimpse should come to me through a lens. I try to balance both of my cameras, one loaded with extra sensitive film for the deep shadows of the forest floor, and a second with slower film for the strong sunlight higher up in the trees. Sweat pours down my face and drips onto the cameras as I strain for my first view of a mountain gorilla. I am totally drenched from the heat and the hike. My body is leaking like one of those watering hoses covered with spray holes. Silver moves toward me and pulls a dry handkerchief out of his coat pocket. He leans in and says, Here, take this to dry off your lenses. Winking at me, he adds, Now you know why it's called a rainforest. Through the brush, I can hear the crunching of leaves and snapping of twigs, breaking the silence like popcorn being munched in a quiet movie theater. The smell is strong, too, like nothing I've ever experienced before. It is rising from caked bits of poop, sweat, food crumbs, and jungle junk that is stuck together and baked into clinging knots in the girl's hair. At first I see a patch of black hair. It could be a shoulder, or maybe it's a knee. I look through my camera again and see a pair of deep, wide eyes shining bright red, like ripe cherries. I press the shutter. I have found the moment that I came here to photograph. Fine moves, and I see a row, row of wide, knobby fingers place a bouquet of spiny tipped leaves into a round bulb of a mouth. My finger presses the camera shutter button, and I record my first mountain gorilla, a female who is carefully selecting the sweetest branches to munch on. As she raises her thick arms for more, she looks as if she's moving in slow motion. When the silverback settles in to slowly chew on some leaves, I gently edge myself a few feet closer. The wall of plants opens up just enough to create a soft green frame around him. Higher up in the treetops, the sunlight shines brightly on the thick, dark coats of the gorillas. With all that light, it is easier for me to spot them and to focus my camera on them, even as they swing among the branches. This moment, frozen on film, transports me back in time to the ancient forest where humankind was born. These gorillas are our close biological cousins, and so their home was our home long before roads and houses were built. A one-year-old
old gorilla emerges from the branches for a few seconds. I have just enough time to focus and hold down the shutter button to get this sequence of photographs. That's adorable. Wow. This mother gorilla keeps a close watch on her baby. The baby will nurse for about a year before gradually adding other foods to its diet. The gorillas' home on the dewy, wet forest floor is filled with vines, bushes, and stalks. I play a kind of peekaboo, moving an inch or two, up, down, or to the side, in order to get this gorilla's face clearly in my frame. Sixty minutes race by. I'm surprised when Silver taps on his watch and holds up two fingers, signaling that we are nearing the end of our visit. It seems as if we only just arrived. My eye stays glued to my camera, hoping for one more picture. Silver tugs on my sleeve. We must leave them now and give them back to the forest. Reluctantly, I turn away, my pockets bursting with used film cans. We hike back through the same challenging terrain, but this time with a sense of calm. The urgency of the morning is past. I have met the Nkringo gorillas and will return to photograph them again tomorrow and the next day. Then I will leave Buindi to spend a day with the mountain gorillas down the road at Gahinga National Park. Although I am in Uganda, an English-speaking country in Central Africa, the plight of the mountain gorilla repeats itself in neighboring Rwanda and the Democratic Republic of the Congo, formerly known as Zaire. The problems facing the mountain gorillas and the benefits that tourism brings to the local people and the animals are shared in all three countries. But the gorillas themselves have no passports. They travel internationally without visas or tour guides as they pursue food supplies on all sides of the border that cuts into their small home range. When gorillas from Gahinga National Park in Uganda cross over into Rwanda during the dry season, the park rangers of both countries work together to ensure the safety of the animals. The Ugandan rangers track the troop right up to the edge of the park and radio the location to the Rwandan rangers who wait to meet them on the other side. The gorillas are thus ambassadors, bringing people together. Look at Silver's family. Once out of the forest, I collapse from exhaustion. In the late afternoon, I sit by the fireplace at the Traveler's Rest Hotel in Kisoro. My muscles stretched and sore from the morning's long, steep climb deep into the impenetrable depths of Buindi. My body aches, and I'm happy to be inside and resting. A loud thunderclap jerks me up and out of my cozy chair. Following the explosion, pounding rain smacks against the thin roof of my sitting room. A trickle of water falls from the small gaps in the grass roof and splashes onto my arm. Searching for something to dry myself with, I reach into my pocket and pull out a handkerchief. It is the one that Silver gave me this morning in the damp forest, his gift to me. I arrived in Africa hoping to encounter Silverback, and now I also have a new friend named Silver. As I look outside, my gaze follows the rushing streams that carry away gobs of dust and brown dirt and long tangles that look like chocolate milk moving through a drinking straw. I stare into the gray mist that covers the outlines of the mountains and the forests. I am within 20 miles of all the mountain gorillas in the world. And the entire species is sharing this downpour with me. Rain is now falling in all three countries that are home to the gorillas. Every known mountain gorilla is getting wet now his or her dark coat soaking up water like a thick black sponge. As I listen to the chattering of the rainfall, I wonder if there is any other place on earth where the survival of a single species is linked together in an area the size of a lone storm cloud. Even though I wasn't invited to sit down and join in the feast, 
I'm grateful to have observed a breakfast in the rainforest. And unlike the gorillas, I am not a vegetarian, and I'm eager to try whatever the chef puts out on the table tonight. If only I can stay awake long enough for dinner. Having breakfast. Right. And then it's just a little extra thing, so that's going to be the end for tonight. Thank you so much for watching. I do hope that you found this video relaxing and educational. And I hope that you have a very good, 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 good,